Okay, so I'm going to start by doing a little exercise with you guys. I'd like you to just shut your eyes for one minute. Okay, don't be scared. <laughs> All right, I'm going to say two words, and I just want you to be cognizant of the images that it brings up and the ideas that it brings up. So the first word is smallholder, and the second word is entrepreneur. Okay, so open your eyes and just think about what kind of images did it bring up? What kind of ideas? Were they differing? And how were they differing? And think about that for a minute. Why did you think that way? This talk, we're going to talk about ideas and we're going to talk about assumptions, mostly. Not misconceptions, assumptions. So a couple of years back, I was lucky enough to work on a research report called Supporting Smallholders into Commercial Agriculture with my colleagues Ngobi Ngobani and Professor Ben Cousins at PLAS at UWC. So this is a project that very valiantly and somewhat naively sought to find, map, and list every single smallholder in the whole of South Africa. Now, let me tell you that no such list exists. Not even does one list not exist. There's not even many smaller lists that you can put together. You know, the way in which smallholders are, the way in which they work and are located doesn't tie in well with um, neatly manicured lists of farmers with things like, you know, contact details, God forbid. So <laughs> during this research project, uh, we were looking for small-scale farmers who are above subsistence, but not yet commercial. And we were specifically looking at how the private sector would support them to the market. So we found over 47,000 farmers we put into a database, did 45 in-depth case studies, and wrote PLAS report number 53. So during this uh, research, we realized that we were making a whole lot of assumptions. And actually, a lot of assumptions had been made before this, when the language used to write the report was given to the funders. And today, we're going to talk about those assumptions. So nowhere is this more apparent than in the title, Supporting Smallholders into Commercial Agriculture. So let's take those four words down. We'll start with support. So support, what kind of... Well, this word, what, what does it bring to mind? You know, too often do we see small-scale farmers kind of described in this language, as we can see on this slide, developing smallholder farmers, helping smallholder farmers, empowering smallholder farmers, and my personal favorite, barriers to entry, which is used often. Now, what is the problem with this? The problem is, with this repetitive framing of smallholder farmers in this way, it means that we start to believe this. It reinforces this pervasive idea that small-scale farmers can't make it to market on their own, that they need support, that they need help. And from who? Who can help these people? Is it the people who have made it? The people who have commercialized? How did they get there? And what is their agenda, is the question. So we kind of bought into this assumption. We thought we'd go into the rural areas and we'd find smallholders kind of having their hands held to market, if you will, by the private sector. But that's not at all what we found. We found a large group of dynamic people who were actually producing their own produce, linking to markets and selling themselves. We found a majority of farmers who were producing, going straight to Boxer and Spa, which are rural supermarkets who can buy from individuals, and so yeah, selling to, to these supermarkets on their own volition, with no help from anyone. A good example of this is the Mikosa Cooperative, which is in Port St. John's. Six farmers, and they sell vegetables to Boxer and Spa and the Kai Fresh Produce Market on a contract year-round. They also sell to hawkers, bucky traders, informal people who are selling on their wares. So now, this is not the beleaguered, you know, smallholder African woman going to market. These are savvy entrepreneurs working across systems, selling their goods. You know, if we to kind of reframe the way we think of smallholders and think of them in the way we think of entrepreneurs, it changes the way you think of the rural areas. And, you know, instead of just trying to make one support system for all of them, you'd actually be like, no, what are these entrepreneurs doing? What linkages are they making? And how could we design policy and programs that support those linkages? So, smallholders, this is where we made our first fallacy, you could say. Why? Because there is no such thing as a smallholder. What on earth is a smallholder? You know, the General Household Survey 2013 found 167,000 smallholders in the country. Stats SA 2012 found 4 million. Uh, Labour Force Survey 2007 found 6 million of these smallholders. We found 47,000, but that's in no way representative of the country. So why this massive disparity in numbers? It's because there is no single definition of smallholder. Even within state departments, the definitions change. And when the definitions change, so do the numbers, and so do their opportunities and their challenges. 
Furthermore, in the lack of one big definition, uh, you get them grouped together. So you get the smallholder, a kind of homogenous group of people who are all the same. And what this does, it kind of obfuscates our ability to really understand what's going on. It means that we can't actually design policy that is relevant and reflective of what is on the ground. In our research, we found massive disparities in smallholders. So smallholders from uh, 10 meter square gardens to the Western Cape 2013 smallholder of the year, who had a farm of 1,036 hectares. <laughs> so how can a farm smallholder have 1,036 hectares? Now, in the Karoo, you need between 40 and 80 hectares to sustain one livestock unit, whereas in case of N, you need between one and two. So this takes us to a classic conundrum of smallholders. How do you define a smallholder? Is it on size of location, size of farm? Is it size of product, or how many products you have? Or often it's done in type. Is it like the type of labor relations to market, your household labor division? There's many different ways to, to uh, understand what smallholders are, and what we need to do is not lump them together and actually spend time to see who are the people we're working with and what are their specific needs. Commercial. <laughs> now, lots of assumptions here, and also um, here the power of language and framing. So the assumption here was that all small farmers want to and should commercialize. The second assumption is what commercialization looks like. So often when we read literature about smallholder farmers, it's always about accessing new markets, linking to global value chains, linking to commercial markets. The thing is, smallholder farmers, the way they produce, how they produce, when they produce, does not tie in with these large global value chains. It doesn't fit nicely. You can't put a square peg in a round hole. And this is why barriers to entry exist. Barriers to entry is anything that impedes or stops a farmer from getting to market. So this can be many things, such as not producing enough, not being able to pass strict standards, not being able to get their foods to market. Now, this often exists in smallholder literatures because we're trying to put smallholders into markets where they don't necessarily belong. Furthermore, there's an assumption that there's a clear linear trajectory from kind of small and informal to large and commercial. And at one point, you can say, you're not commercial and you're informal. And another point, you could say that is what commercial and that is, that's what formal is. And that's just not true in reality. It's not that neat. Often you get mixes of these things. So an example of that is the Lamoni Family Trust, which is a, farm, a family trust. They've got a farm in the Eastern Cape. And they have 1,000 broilers, 60 pigs, 80 goats, over 100 head of cattle. Now, these guys exist solely in the informal sector. They buy and sell without contracts. They don't sell to major stores. Most of their um, product is selling cows for uh, traditional ceremonies, because apparently their cattle are very loud when slaughtered, and that's a very good thing. <laughs> so these guys, what are they then? Are they informal? Are they formal? Are they commercial? Are they not? Are they hybrid? <laughs> you know, in our study, we found that the majority of our farmers, 42,747 of them, in fact, were, what we were acting in what was kind of called the informal economy, or the secondary economy. So these are farmers who grow their own produce, they sell, often on handshake agreements, to you know, agro-processors, other farmers, individuals, supermarkets. They sell what they have, when they have it. Now, um, these farmers would kind of be classed as being in the informal economy, but in my brain, it doesn't make sense. If the overriding mode of a transaction in a system is one way, then surely that is the formal system? Surely that is the way that things are done? You know, for me, this is where the language comes in. The powers, the people who decided what is informal and what is formal, what is commercial and not commercial, and for, more importantly, which one is good and which one is bad, were people in power a long time ago with a distinct agenda in place to delineate these things and add normative value to them, and an economic game to be made from them. By us kind of continuing to use this language, informal and formal, willy-nilly without thinking what kind of normative assumptions come behind it, we reinforce this thinking. So it's important for us to realize that often internalized subconscious ideologies make informality seem undesirable, and commercialization seem like the only and the desired end, when actually it's not. Commercialization, or full commercialization, is just one option in a bouquet of choices. We need to remember that informality is not a dirty word. 
So now agriculture, I'm cheating a bit here. I'm going to talk about the food system as a whole. <laughs> so here, our assumptions are that if we get all small-scale farmers and we fully commercialize them and we put them into these global value chains, that they'll have better livelihoods and we'll have greater food security and greater, cheaper access to food for all. And is that true? <laughs> it's not true, actually, because what we're seeing is whereby in the North we often see large corporates push out smaller businesses. In the food system, this is something that's called supermarketization. It's a very easy word. <laughs> supermarketization. So this is the process where supermarkets, by people buying more and more, can then uh, sell food more cheaply and kind of undercut the local formal and informal food traders. And actually what's happening is this process is being led by South African supermarkets into the African continent. So this has a lot of effects. What it means for small-scale farmers is that they are kind of pushed out of engaging in this system. Supermarkets don't want to deal with lots of small farmers. They don't want palaver. They want one farmer in one truck who can bring them everything at the time when they want it. That's who they'll deal with. So if we reinforce the system by actively just buying from supermarkets all the time and not producing, uh, supporting local producers, we're creating a system which privileges the few who have already made it, often off the backs of many, um, and not the many. Furthermore, it's promoting different uh, consumer behavior in terms of what people buy. People are moving to more uh, Western diets, which is causing obesity, and it's causing a the monopoly of the food system, which was in my colleague's slide earlier, where a few large brands and large food companies have the power to dictate what is made and how it is made. This is what we're heading for. This is the, we're just going towards this by our behavior, and if we don't change our behavior, this is the ultimate end. Is this something we want? Do we want a food system like that, or do we want a food system which is a tapestry of small farmers, big farmers, local markets, non-local markets, where we can get good food and actually privileges the many and not just the few? So, what has been the kind of takeaway? What's the point of this talk? You know, I've talked about food systems and farming and agriculture, but actually this talk is meant to be about more than that. It's about words, it's about framing, it's about ideology, and ultimately, it's, it's about power. You know, today we've talked about the farm, but you can take this critical lens and cast it to anything. You can read the news, you can engage with colleagues, you can look at programs, and you can look at policy critically to look in between what's written, to look for the implied and the suggested and the assumptions behind that, because once you start doing that, can you actually truly understand someone's position, where they're coming from and what their agenda is? So until we start doing this more and more and actually seeking this truer communication, only then can we actually try and engender change as individuals or organizations or movement that will actually be long-lasting. It's very important that we lift the veil of our assumptions and seek out proper understanding so we can act in a matter that is true and really change the world. Thanks. Thank you.